Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here in Vancouver. What a beautiful, beautiful city. Um, I had imagined it as a very wet place, but it's been perfect. <laughs> Absolutely perfect. So thank you for having me here and thank you for that lovely introduction. The topic that um, I was asked to talk about, legitimation, is of course one of those very fraught topics at the moment where um, there's an increasing press from neoliberal governments and organisations to produce what is regarded as legitimate, that is, positivist research. And it's been very difficult to defend um, qualitative research within the paradigm that it's being attacked in. So the terms of legitimation simply don't make sense within the... Hi, Bill. <laughs> within the qualitative paradigm. So what I'm trying to do today is to see how these can be brought together and bumped up against each other. How, how are the neoliberal um, bureaucrats thinking about legitimate research and defending it? And how might we speak back to that? Not necessarily in the same terms, but what, what will it mean to speak back in a way that they might hear? Because the catch cry that I keep hearing is, um, well, then you tell me how what you're doing is legitimate. And um, because we don't think in the terms under which we're being attacked, we stand there stupidly and don't know how to answer. So in a way, what this paper is doing is trying to um, make some ground with working out what the answers might be instead of just saying, well, we're not even speaking in your terms. So picking up then the concept of leg legitimation and thinking about that. Okay. So the first recognisable uh, definition of le legitimate from the Collins English Dictionary, conforming to established standards of usage, behaviour, etc., based on correct or acceptable principles of reasoning, reasonable, sensible or valid, authorised, sanctioned by or in accordance with law. Okay, it's a, that's what legitimate research is within the current bureaucratic terms. Okay, in this definition, legitimacy is concerned with conformity to practices that have, one way or another, acquired a status comparable to the law. In the broad field of social and educational research, legitimacy has been colonised, perhaps predictably, by those working in, quotes, empirical research, a field characterised by adherence to the rules of scientific method and by a belief in causal, evidence-based reasoning that is more often than not backed by statistical estimates of probability and generalisability. In scientific discourse, empirical means, quote, derived from or relating to experiment and observation rather than theory. It is this conception of data as holding meaning independent of theory that best characterises the empirical endeavour. In such research, truth claims rest on method rather than the interpretive work involved in formulating and asking questions, generating data, or the work that is done in representing and articulating the new forms of understanding that are emergent in the research. Indeed, interpretation is to be abhorred as it introduces an illegitimate bias into otherwise pure data and mathematical calculations. This proprietorial claim on legitimacy by the empiricists poses an interesting dilemma for post-empiricist researchers. Do they abandon the term, terms as meaningless for their own purposes or recolonize it through post-empirical deconstructive work on it? Or neither, or both of these. In order to open up this discussion, we need to ask how any research findings acquire the status of truth. And how is the production of this truth related to governmentality or the control of populations through the ordering and legitimating of what will be understood as true or false? At the same time, if legitimation is to be revisioned as meaningful in the post-critical and post-realist field, we may need to consider a different definition than the one that I began with. Legitimate. Born in lawful wedlock, 
enjoying full filial rights, filial, resembling or suitable to a son or daughter. In this definition, the question of legitimacy would not be about adherence to rules that have been prescribed by authoritative others, but about the ways in which the work, work might be recognised as that of a legitimate offspring, and about its capacity to move the inherited discourses into a new generation of thought. Children are not necessarily obedient to their parents' rules, but can nonetheless be recognised by them and encouraged to flourish in diverse, surprising and unexpected ways taking up what they've learned from their parents and using it elsewhere in a move that exceeds what the parents could imagine. In such a model, in Butler's terms, agency exceeds the power by which it is enabled. Legitimate research in this definition is emergent. Is that something we should be worrying about? <laughs> oh, okay. Engaging in post-critical, post-realist research requires not obedience, but a capacity to engage creatively with a possibility opened by others. As Deleuze said of Foucault's work, with which he was creatively engaged, the approach to it should not be one of obedience, but independence. When people follow Foucault, when they're fascinated by him, it's because they're doing something with him in their own work, in their own independent lives. It's not just a question of intellectual understanding or agreement, but of intensity, resonance, musical harmony. Sorry. I'll leave that there for a moment. In the next part of, of what I'm going to do then, I want to map the field of post-critical and post-realist research. So, um, Starting with Paddy Lather's um, table, the um, work that the different models have done in this um, way of framing it that Paddy Lather set up is that the positive, positive, sorry, positivist <coughs> paradigm has the work of predicting what will happen. Um, the um, interpretive paradigm has the work of understanding what's happening. The emancipatory paradigm is um, critical and praxis oriented, and the post-structuralist paradigm has the task of deconstructing. So they're, they're very different approaches to what it is that we're trying to do with um, the research endeavor. The power of positivist or empirical research lies in its claimed capacity to predict. Such research had its heyday in the post-World War II period which was characterised by, in Lather's terms, humanist romance of knowledge as cure. It was given a major boost when computers became readily available in the 70s and early 80s, placing sophisticated statistical manipulations within anyone's reach, in theory at least. Its most secure niche was in psychology and educational psychology departments. In marked contrast, philosophy, sociology and history departments, along with their education counterparts, were more interested in how theories of individual and social action enable different kinds of truth to be told. Understanding required the generation of new thinking that lay at the complex interface of human experience and conceptual analysis. With the revolutionary movements of the 60s culminating in university, universities worldwide, sorry, culminating in universities worldwide in the events of May 68, when students and workers united to overthrow the power of the establishment and with a growing feminist presence in universities in the 70s and 80s, understanding became an insuffici insufficient justification for research. The critical theorists were interested in emancipation, not just understanding. So the necessity of movement became uh, central to the research endeavor designing a pedagogy of resistance within communities of difference in taking back voice and reclaiming narrative for one's own rather than adapting to the narratives of a dominant majority and thus in overturning oppression and achieving social justice through empowerment of the marginalised.